Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with AR. I want to share some resilient destination cities in our three destination regions. The first region I'm going to hit is in the east. I'm going to be starting in Pennsylvania and talking about just one city with good resilience potential in each of our states of interest, sharing a little bit about the city's future climate and its culture. So in Pennsylvania, there are a lot of good picks. I mean, a lot. If you stay out of Philadelphia, you're otherwise looking at fair to good outlooks. And it's not like Philadelphia is doomed or something. I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't experience growth from people leaving other major East Coast metros. Philadelphia is going to get super hot in the summer. The rest of the state is staying relatively cool. I mentioned Scranton in the Pennsylvania state level forecast, and I want to highlight the city again here. This is a nice sized city, about 75,000 people in the overall metro area. Which, let me show you this on the map. This is where Scranton is. It's in this place called the Wyoming Valley that you can see obviously is pretty desirable because it's been pretty filled in there, right? So Scranton is up towards the north side of it. We can see the interstate goes through. We can see that there are pretty big game preserves on other side of it. So that's useful for a potential biodiversity bank, right? And uh, if we talk about the change that they're going to experience, they've got pretty good cool summer preservation amongst the best in the Wyoming Valley as we talk about into the north side of that valley and just slightly warmer winters where you're marginal on the change in the plant hardiness zone. So it's a small enough jump in plant hardiness zone that there's some very good rational, realistic hope there for the survival of mature plants. So there's a lot of practical reasons why Scranton looks good. It's got economic support from the rest of the Wyoming Valley. The real estate will probably be relatively higher because of the relatively cool climate in that large developed area. It's got good access, it's got good biodiversity reserves, but that's not why I'm highlighting the place. I know that this is dumb. I know I don't really talk like this much, but I've got a good feeling about this place. And I don't think it's just that I've heard the name a bunch of times. When I was doing the Pennsylvania forecast, kind of looking deep into the state level data for the state, just feel a pattern and Scranton is just pinging for me. Let's say I'm both rationally and irrationally positive about the outlook for this city. And when I dug a little bit deeper into the cultural stuff, that kept me feeling good, actually. In these city-level videos, I want to talk about cultural danger factors a little, because like many of my fellow Americans, I don't want to live in a Nazi-rich environment. So out with like the ACLU, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Scranton looks okay. No big pings here. We're talking about a place where there are no active hate groups documented in the city, variety of healthy looking religious minority communities. I think that there are signs here that this is not only a great climate destination, but a pretty welcoming destination. In a legal context, the middle district, which is their US attorney's office that overlays Scranton, one of the first to participate in the United Against Hate Initiative. This is not a utopia type area, but this is an area that's very interested in fighting systemic discrimination, bringing us into a future that is gonna have opportunities for all Americans. It's good. Let's head up to New York. The New York forecast is really interesting. If you're interested in this part of the world, inland New York is going to have the most diversity of change of any state in the US, where some places like Buffalo are gonna just transform massive changes to winter and summer temperatures and precipitation trends. And other places are gonna be like, basically unchanged, like upstate New York, basically unchanged. I'm going to highlight a place with relatively low levels of change, pretty mild change, which is in the Mohawk Valley. We're going to be talking about two cities here, Utica and Rome, that are close together in the Mohawk Valley. Those are your two uh, major population centers. The whole Mohawk Valley is very interesting. These cities and particularly Utica, I wanted to highlight because people say mean things about them all the time in this sort of uh, generalized ragging on. That reminds me a lot of how people in the Chicago area rag on the entire state of Iowa, which makes me think that maybe you guys are as cool as we are in Iowa, which I say very lovingly. The climate outlook there is um, really nice. You're talking about a shift towards uh, zone six from zone five, but you're on the edge of the zone five boundary. You're talking about a couple more weeks over 86 in the summer, but not bad, pretty good, cool summer preservation. And you're talking about being just south of that new zone five boundary, just south 
of an extremely large, low population density, incredibly stable climactic zone there in upstate New York. So if you're interested in these sort of low pop things, just to highlight it, being 20, 30 miles north of these cities, north of Utica and Rome, could be a really good opportunity. In terms of racial diversity, cultural type issues, if we look at a map of Utica, we see evidence of intense segregation. But I feel like we can't make this a breaking news story because American cities are often divided in this way. It's just the reality that there is systemic racism all across our country. But we look beyond that map, we look to see if people are putting money into the problem. The Mohawk Valley, Utica is in an area where they are dumping like $10 million in the next two years towards working on issues of systemic inequality and discrimination. And seeing that kind of investment in this precious area, the Mohawk Valley is precious. If you look at the inland New York forecast, it is the obvious place where you'll be able to exchange a tremendous diversity of goods from the many emerging microclimates in New York State. So seeing that kind of investment in an area of this level of strategic importance, I think we got big potential for cultural change, for growth, for a strong local economy, where anyone who wants the chance to do some work is going to be able to get in the game. I think it's a hopeful sign. I think it's another reason to think this is another community where we got an okay baseline for welcoming. We got a place here that is trying to move into a strong, inclusive future. New York State, a lot of positives. Let's go up to Vermont. And I'm going to actually talk a little bit more about New York State in this context, because we're talking about the area around Lake Champlain. In Vermont, we're going to be highlighting Burlington, Vermont, which is a city that I talked about already in the big three, because it is just fantastic. All around Lake Champlain is good. You're talking about a slight decrease in um, winter lows. You're going to be moving a plant hardiness zone. And the summers are very well conserved on the eastern side of the lake. Not so good on the western side. The eastern side is the most privileged side, and you were able to see on the larger map that there is, similar to the Mohawk Valley, similar to the Wyoming Valley, a nice cluster of economic development where the region will be strong, and this is the most privileged city in the region. Burlington is a small city, about 45,000 people, but that's the biggest city in Vermont. It's been running entirely on renewable energy since 2015 because they're awesome and completely hardcore. The big threat when you're talking about what changes you need to prepare for in the Lake Champlain area in Vermont in general is increased flooding because of the increased extreme weather. I want to show you, Vermont has the best state level flood mapping tool that I've seen in the entire nation because they are very serious about action here very clearly. You can see what other people are doing. You can see what is known about current flood hazards. And you can see if you're going to be able to get national flood insurance or not, if you're looking at property in the area. All of those are really strong things. There's something that is even better, though, than their flood tool, which is the fact that Burlington as a city is working to change their zoning laws because they want to get ready for people to come there with high density housing. They know you want to move there. They want you to be able to come and they want to build a city that people want to live in, like a walkable city. Their future, with all of their risk factors in mind, they're thinking about quality of life. They're clearly very smart. And culturally, Vermont is in a great resilience position. Their interest in agricultural and economic resilience is long and well documented. There's a lot of state level energy that's gone to the preservation of local food culture and local economic diversity. These are huge positives. It is known that Vermont culture, if you want to stay a state, has a personality. Vermont's not exactly warm and fuzzy. If you want people to bring you cookies when you move in, move to Iowa or Minnesota. Apparently, if you want to live in flood aware, high density housing, then you got to move to Vermont. So this is minuses. Talking about racial issues, Vermont in general has challenges with racism. People of color are at least three times more likely to be pulled over and searched by Vermont by uh, the cops in Vermont. It's a, it's a problem. It's obviously bad. It's important to consider though, the fact that we have that data that people are talking about this problem means that there's actual work to push for change in an organized way. Not every place that has that kind of injustice is willing to talk about it or look it in the face. Burlington as a city is working on systemic racism as a public health emergency. That's good. It gives reason for hope around cultural change. 
between that initiative and the push for high density housing, I think that it is only fair to credit Burlington as a good destination city in terms of welcoming. And it's a fantastic city in terms of climate destination. There's some really good signs there. Now let's move on over to New Hampshire at Manchester, New Hampshire with you. And I'm gonna pull that up on a map so that you can see it. If you're not aware, uh, like super familiar with the area, we see that Manchester is a pretty big city in New Hampshire. It's far enough away from the sea that you are able to avoid a lot of the threats of direct sea level rise or saltwater incursion, the soil becoming more saline. And it's a pretty big town. We're talking about 115,000 people there. It's got a good climate outlook if you like it warm. And I know some of you are summer people, right? I'm sure there's someone watching here who's thinking about moving a little north from the Carolinas who wants to have a warm summer, but not like a blistering summer. You can see that here we're looking at a substantial summer increase up to about 90 days with temperatures over 86 a year. This is the Eastern city with the warmest projections that I'm profiling in this video. Their current mayor, Joyce Craig, is a major leader on climate issues. They're a top concern for her. They've done a lot to convert Manchester's uh, infrastructure over to more sustainable energy, over towards more sustainable business practices. And it's clear that sustainability is a big deal. Their business center is focusing on sustainability right now. Like it's cool to be engaged in green work. And there are other things about the city that are cool too. I mean, their art museum is really good. However, I feel like when we're talking about cultural issues in New Hampshire, we need to take a look at the hate map. If we wanna talk about how many people in different states in this potential region are affiliated with recognized hate groups, you can see that New Hampshire is coming up the darkest of the states. And if we look, Manchester has uh, hate groups that are being tracked in the city that are engaged in anti-Muslim activity. This is not that everyone in Manchester is like some huge racist or whatever. Obviously not. I'm saying that there are more people per capita who are associated with hate groups and that we have reason to think that there are particularly strong anti-Muslim bias in the state. We need to be able to look at this when we're talking about destination trends. We need to be able to dig a little bit deeper and think about is this a destination that's welcoming for all Americans or not? And I feel like there's enough warning bells here that despite excellence and the investment in uh, resilience in Manchester, we need to point out that there are some issues that have to be addressed a little bit more. And that continues as we move up to Maine. Maine has some fantastic climate stability, particularly if you're interested in low population destinations. But this video is not about low population des destinations. We're trying to talk about decent sized metro areas where you can like find a good job. And if we're talking about that, there's one decent sized area that emerges as the obvious front runner, which is Lewiston and the Lewiston Augusta sort of developed area here. Why? It's far enough inland that you're avoiding a lot of your major sea level rise challenges. It's far enough inland that you have a less dramatic climactic zone shift, less of a winter warm up than you have right by the coast, and you have good summer coolness preservation there. Lewiston is a city that has an emerging interest in being known as a climate destination. They're known to have little violent crime, which they like to advertise. They have good medical care, and they want to promote themselves as kind of generally fun with cultural stuff to do and good economic diversity. The city doesn't appear to have its own climate action plan, but the state of Maine, let's be fair, has one of the best state level plans for action in the entire nation. On the cultural front, this is another place where the city has some struggles. I mean, the few years ago, the mayor had to resign because he had super racist text messages, which it's good he had to resign, right? Last fall, there was a neo-Nazi march in Lewiston, and it's also on Ranker's list of towns to stay far, far away from. I would be inclined to say that that list might be BS. You know, it popped up while I was searching for Lewiston. Ranker is not exactly a scientific source, but Anna Illinois is on that list. And as someone who's sort of from the Iowa, Illinois corridor, we do talk about Anna Illinois. So it's hard to say. I get the impression that many people in Lewiston want to move into America's future. You know, they want to move into a strong, inclusive future. And they're frustrated by the way that they're perceived. 
This is a city that needs to get into the struggle. There's less evidence that addressing these systemic issues is a priority in Maine than in, say, Pennsylvania, New York, or Vermont. I think that it's worth noting and worth talking about when we're talking about evaluating climate destinations, if there are places that are safe for all Americans. So summing everything up, I feel like we were able to establish kind of a regional client of welcoming at the state level and establish that when you find a good climate destination, you need to dig a little deeper if you're going to consider moving there. Some decent sized cities that I think are good climate destinations. The next video I'm going to make about decent sized Midwestern destination cities, then destination cities in the inland Pacific Northwest. And after that, if you, like me, feel itchy talking about all these 100K plus cities to move to, we're going to talk about low pop destinations because I know that many of us on this channel share my temperament and do not want to move to a city again. I'm going to help you out. I hope this video helps you think about some ways you could evaluate destinations yourself. And I hope you think about how this list is hardly exhaustive. I mean, look at the inland New York forecast. If you want to see some other cities that have opportunities, look at the Pennsylvania forecast. There's a lot going on in that inland part of the country. In this region, there are a lot of great destinations. It's good to be aware of some of the outlook trends in the individual states. If this is the region you want, you're going to find a place that's a great fit for you.